Some of you might remember that a while back I designed and created a cool lift top coffee table. Now we kept this table outside on our patio and we'd occasionally lift it up and have a meal together around it. Well, my wife wanted a fire table and instead of setting my coffee table on fire for her, she opted to get this one and told me to move the old one upstairs to our deck. Which will work out good since the only thing we have on our deck now is a little rusty table and a dead plant. But if we're going to have a table up here, I'll need to design and build some furniture to go around it. So I jumped into Fusion 360 and here's what I came up with. A chair and a love seat. Let's take the cushions out since they're pretty hard to make out of wood. Now I wanted to give the pieces a stocky feel. Something that would match the table. And I think the big rectangular sides really do that. Someone also gave me the idea to use bridle joints on the arms, and I'm pretty excited to try that out. And all the rest of it will be put together with just dados and half flaps, which will make this thing pretty easy to put together. Alright, well, let's see if I can make these things strong enough so they don't collapse under a lard bucket like me. The first step is to take a quick stop off at my neighbor's garage and to remove that pesky pile of cedar lumber that he had lying on the floor, taking up a whole bunch of space. You know, it's a small thing, but removing this tripping hazard is just one of the reasons why my neighbor must be thrilled living next to me. Now to get this project started, the first thing I need to do is to fold up the wings on my mobile miter station. This will give me plenty of support when cutting the long boards. I love this thing. It's been a huge space saver for me over the years. What's nice is I can slide on my stop block, bump the boards up to it, and make a bunch of pieces all exactly the same size. And a whole bunch more pieces. And even more. And then eventually, I got all the pieces cut out. The next step was to remove all those rounded edges. I skimmed off one side of each board, and then I set the fence to 3 inches, and then I could remove the other side. Then, to cut all the slats for the seat bottom and the seat back, I essentially split one board right down the middle, and then I just did that about a zillion times. Next up was dealing with the 4x4s. To remove the rounded edges, I had to perform each cut in two steps. After the first, I'd just flip the piece end for end and then I'd trim off what I couldn't reach on the first cut. Plus, this gave me a chance to completely cover myself in cedar sawdust, which, in turn, made me smell wonderful. Guys, forget about buying that expensive cologne. Just cover yourself with cedar sawdust. Well, come to think of it, with lumber prices the way they are, it's probably cheaper to buy the cologne. Now it's time to start cutting the bridle joints into the legs. I figured the best way to do that would be to use my tenoning jig on the table saw. This thing rides on the fence of the saw and securely holds the workpiece vertically. I mark out where the tenon needs to be and then I can start making some cuts. I nudge the fence over between cuts and I can remove all the rest of the material to make the shoulder for the tenon. Since things look good, I adjust the fence back to cut the cheek and then I make all the cuts for all the legs. It was a lot of clamping and unclamping, but at least I knew all the tenons would be exactly the same. Next, I brought each leg to the bandsaw and I removed the bulk of the material from the shoulders and then just took each one back to the table saw cleaned it up, and made the shoulders perfect. Now when cutting the mortises, I started in the center and I kept rotating the piece after each cut. I slowly worked my way outward until I could fit my calipers in the gap. This let me sneak up on the perfect fit. And once I had the position just right, I just made all the cuts for all the mortises in each of the legs. Then I took them to the bandsaw to remove the bulk of the material. Lastly, I cleaned them up on the table saw just like I did for the tenons. Now I could do a test fit and see how well they go together. And 
Judging by my goofy grin, you can see that I was pretty pleased with the results. The top pieces of each of the arm assemblies gets a notch cut out of the back. This is for a stretcher that will ultimately hold up the backrest for the chair. I space it out on the crosscut sled using a piece of scrap and then cut a perfectly sized notch for it. Next up was cutting some dados and the vertical pieces for some more bracing. I used my magnetic stop block and some 123 blocks to help me dial in the perfect measurements for the dado. With both sides of the dado being cut, I could then just clean out all the remaining material and give it a test fit. Perfect! Now it was just rinse and repeat for all the remaining legs. Many of the boards are connected using half laps. For this, I adjust the blade height so that it's exactly half the thickness of the piece, and I chew away the material on the ends. The last pieces to get notches cut in are the cross members of the seats and the backrest. These will be where each of the individual slats gets put in. Well, there's the slats themselves that need to get cut as well. So, I guess they're the last pieces. Needless to say, it's a lot of pieces, and all I can say is thank God for dado stacks. Trying to do this without a dado stack, it would have been as fun as being barefoot in a room full of Legos. But after all this, I was sorting out all the pieces when I got a call from my friend Davis. Hey! Hey, Drew, how's it going? Hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. I oh, just good. wanted to, uh, to call and say hey and uh, tell you about something that Jenny and I have been working on. I got an idea for you. Okay, what is it? So, as you know, Jenny and I have built two woodworking businesses out of our own house. And we're trying to share everything that we've learned with anybody that wants to learn it. Oh, cool. We've put together an online course that shows everybody step-by-step step what we've done to make the first $10,000 in both of our woodworking businesses. Oh, wow. And I know that a lot of your audience is probably trying to sell stuff out of their basement. So we've called the program My Basement Business. Basically, the idea is that we cover everything that anybody starting a woodworking business needs to know to make their first $10,000. That's really what the idea we tried to build the course around. And we cover everything from pricing your work to how to pick a product to sell and exactly what to say and who to say it to to make your first $10,000 in sales. Because you've been such a good friend to us, Drew. We want to pass that friendship along to the viewers and give them a 15% discount code on the program. So if they use the link that I just sent you and they use the code FISHER15 at checkout, they can get an additional 15% off the whole program. But there's a super secret way that they can get the program for free. It's this whole loophole Jenny and I built into the program. So um, what you do is you go through your link and you use the discount code, you get the program just like normal. And then once you follow the step-by-step -step guide, you should have enough money that you, you've got a pretty good sized profit at the end of the course. And what you can do is there's an offer in the program to join the stud stack. That's a private network that we have of other maker business owners. If you join that group for three months with the money that you earn selling your work, you let us know and we will go back and refund the entire purchase price of the My Basement Business program. That way you can get the program and three months in the stud stack without any money out of your own pocket. Get out of here. That's awesome. That's a phenomenal offer. Yeah, we really want to empower people to, to make money and, and follow their, their dreams of, of starting the business and selling their work, no matter how big or how small they want uh, their business to be. So what you're saying is what they can do is they can go to my website, they can buy my plans, and then they can get your program, and they can start their own business making my products, and they can make a fortune, and it's no cost to them. And if they steal the materials from your neighbor, they don't even have to spend money on materials costs. <laughs> hey, this is great. Thanks so much, man. Uh, I think my audience is going to love this. I sure hope so, man. I can't wait to meet them all. And uh, thanks again to you for supporting us for so long. We're super happy to be able to partner with you on this. Yeah, of course, man. Awesome. Well, hey, take it easy. Yeah, you too. Thanks. All right. Now I could put this together with some taparoos and a bunch of clamps. And 
once it all dried, I could take the clamps off. I sanded the edges to even them out. And then I used my trim router to put a small round over on everything. Now I could actually start to put the arms and the legs together. The joints were a bit snug to begin with, but the glue acted as a lubricant, so they slid together pretty good for the most part. And just like with my dog, if I squeeze really tightly, stuff will start to ooze out. For the cleats that will hold up the seat bottom, I decided to put a chamfer on the end, so I just grinded off the corners using my disc sander. Now these get mounted onto the middle brace of each arm assembly. I started with some glue, but then I also added some additional support by drilling, countersinking, and driving in some screws. Next, I could space the two assemblies apart with the seat bottom and then fasten in the stringer along the back. I brushed in a bunch of glue into the notch. I slid the piece into position. And I clamped things up to dry. Then while it was clamped, I drilled, countersunk, and drove in a couple screws. Now I could do pretty much the exact same thing with the seat bottom. I spread some glue along the top of the cleats. I positioned the bottom into place and clamped it up to dry. And then I added some screws from underneath to secure it even further. The seat back is a different story. I position the back on the chair in a way where the seat cushion will have enough room. Then I tilt it back until it rests against the back stringer. From there, I can drive in a couple screws to hold it in place. Then from underneath, I drive in a couple more up through the seat bottom to secure the other side of the backrest. And then, the chair is done. At this point, I was pretty excited to try it out, and I couldn't wait any longer. I lifted it off the bench, and I didn't even bother taking it out of the shop. Instead, I went and got the cushions and decided to give this chair a test drive right here and now. This is nice. It's comfy. Love it. Alright, let's make the big one. And the big one went together in exactly the same way. The only difference is that since cedar is a softwood, and since I like to eat chips, I decided to add a couple center braces to keep it from collapsing in the middle. Then I got the wife to help me carry them both outside. And then pivot! Pivot! I pivot! <laughs> For real? Alright, there we go. I sprayed on a sealer, which really made the cedar pop, and it should give it some decent protection from the elements. They'll need that since these are just going to be sitting outside. The last thing I added was some of these little plastic feet. I just hammered one in on each corner and foot that was touching the ground. The only thing left to do was to put cushions down and enjoy them. I really love how they turned out. The bridle joints are so cool looking, and they really are an awesome accent. The half laps sure made the thing go together easy, and they look great too. And that stocky feel that I was going for, I think I nailed it. Plus, they match the coffee table too. Well, I couldn't be happier. These things are going to be great. They're going to let us have lots of dinners outside during the summers. Now, if you'd like to make this patio furniture for yourself, I have very detailed step-by-step -step instructions available on my website over at fishersshoponline.com. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to like it and give me a comment down below. And if you're new to the channel and you feel I've earned it, consider subscribing. I've got a ton of other videos that I'm sure you'll enjoy, as well as many more to come.
Thanks to Jenny and Davis for their special offer too. If you're interested in starting your own basement business, I'll have links in the video description where you can find out more about their program. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Pencil, pencil. Holy crap, skis! Crap! One of these pieces is not like the other. You're an idiot, and you gotta make another. Oh, crap! I'm not getting that again. You like my water fountain? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, you idiot. I just realized I mounted both these legs upside down. This notch that's cut out here needs to be down here. And if it's up here, these legs need to be flipped and switched. Oh my gosh! Ugh, come on, Drew! Ugh.